OK. So when you look back, how did you learn what you know today? American actor Will Rogers once said about learning, there are three kinds of men. The one that learns by reading, the few who learn by observation, and then, of course, there's number three, <coughs> personal experience. When I talk about how we learned AEM, I'm talking about number three. <laughs> so um, what was our early experience with um, AEM? We had painful upgrades. In general, we had slow progress, slower than we expected. Some of our code turned out to be hard to change. And when code is hard to change, then, of course, it's hard to fix bugs. And um, every once in a while, we changed something, we fixed something, and um, something else in a different area of the code base broke, uh, which led to regression bugs. And we were asking ourselves, what's happening? So what did our early AM code look like? We had some tests, um, but we had a pretty low coverage. Um, and um, moreover, those few tests that we had were expensive to do. Um, they required a lot of setup code and were hard to maintain. On top of that, they were slow and they were fragile. And when tests are slow and fragile, what do you do? Yeah, of course, you ignore them which means you spend a lot of time and effort into writing tests, and then you get even less coverage because you ignore tests. OK, so naturally, what do you do when you don't have enough tests? You log. OK, we logged a lot. Some parts of the code looked like if log debug is enabled, log debug for big portions of the code base. We had high coupling, which also explained to some extent why Upgrades were painful, and um, some important logic was spread all over the code base, leading to lo um, low cohesion. That was not what we wanted. Okay, So what we wanted is we worked on projects, and we are still working on projects that are, are intended to be in production for a long time. Um, one of our systems has a planned lifetime of 10 years. So if you want to work on such a time scale, of course, you want your software to be reliable. You want to have confidence in your code. OK, so when a change request comes in, um, you don't want to say, OK, but I'm not going to touch the code. Uh, I know what it looks like. You want to be confident when you change code. That means that you need to understand what's going on. You want to be in control of a code base instead of having the code base tell you what you will do today, for example, looking for bugs in production. And of course, over 10 years, we need to be adaptable and extensible. We even had a plan how to do that. Okay, So um, we knew that in order to achieve that, we needed tests to prevent regression bugs. And we also plan to have a lot of tests to get a high coverage. Also, over the course of 10 years, the team will change, of course. So people will leave the team, new people will come in. So you need something to manage your knowledge. <coughs> and you also need to have control of your dependencies. There are usually many ways to screw up a project, but losing control of your dependencies is pretty effective. So we wanted to avoid that. And of course, we wanted to have high cohesion and low coupling. That was the plan. OK, so let me tell you a little, little story. Um, in 2005, I was working as a freelancer. So that was like 30, 40 years ago when we used things like JSP. Oh, it's still there. Um, and Surflets, Hibernate, and so on, and other things that I can't remember anymore. Um, the company who hired me forced me to do test-driven development. So naturally, I did the only logical thing that a developer would do in my position. I explained to them in detail how very wrong they are, 
um, and um, well, that we don't need it, and that it's going to um, slow us down, and so on. And they were very nice people. They listened to me, but they didn't follow. So I had to do it. That's a freelancer's way of life. Um, but then, suddenly, I had this, this light bulb, you know, this light bulb here over my head. Um, that was the moment when I realized what TDD actually is, how it works, and why it's pretty great. So what is great about TDD? First of all, you have fewer bugs, but OK, yeah, that's to be expected. You have a lot of tests, so that's only logical. The second point is you have a permanently up-to-date documentation. In traditional programming um, teams, you have wikis and Word documents, and you know that they are lies, right? I mean, the moment you write them, they are already out of date. The code will tell you what it does. Okay, you need to stare at the code so it tells you what it does. But the documentation, if you have tests, then your tests will give you a specification that tells you what the code should do. And if you're not sure if uh, code and specification match, you just run the tests. The other thing about TDD that struck me was something that I didn't expect and that is still hard to explain to people, and that is you work faster. One of the reasons is that you have a fast response cycle. So you write a little bit of testing, test code, and then you write a little bit of production code. If it's green later on, then you're fine. If it's not, then you just have to redo, let's say, one or two minutes of work. And the coolest part is you can do it all in your IDE, so you don't need Maven, OK? Um, you, well, first you need Maven, but you only need it a couple of times per day, but not all the time. You can do the ma major part of your work all in the IDE. The second reason is a little more, more subtle. It's the fact that TDD will give you... TDD is a tool that you can use to check your design decisions. So it, my experience in programming is it works like this. You write a bunch of lines of code, and then you delete half of them, and then you write a little more, and then you restructure it, and then you really read what's in the specification, and then you refactor, and so on. You may even feel productive while doing that, but actually you're, you're just busy. While on the other hand, TDD will give you a tool that can lead you to a solution in a straightforward way. So that's, of course, the reason why it's called test-driven development. It follows the philosophy, if it's hard to test, then it's likely poorly designed. Okay, so what you do is you focus on creating testable code, and for your design decision, decisions you say, you ask yourself, what makes the code more testable? And you have multiple options, and you can decide which one to use, then, well, which of my options yields more testable code? TDD works best when you use a test-first approach. So test-first <coughs> means you write a test first. So here's a little test. Um, this is a specification. It means that 6 is the expected result of factorial of 3. So 1 times 2 times 3 should be 6. And then we write the production code for that, for example, as a recursive function. This kind of approach is used by other people in your company as well. Your accountants. This is the way they work when they do double entry accounting. So they have accounts like for furniture and cash, and then they have their debit column and their credit column. And when you subtract debit from credit, it should always result in zero. In terms of test-driven development, that would be running a test. Now, why do accountants work like this? Well, they need to deal with details. So they have numbers. It's easy to screw things up with a typo. And those um, little glitches can lead to big problems. That sounds pretty much like the work of a developer to me. And that's the reason why this kind of approach also works pretty nicely in development. 
what we have in development that accountants don't have is the last step of TDD, and that's refactoring. So let's refactor the code. Um, maybe because we think that um, using recursive functions in, in Java and uh, factorial in a recursive way uh, will not work. So let's uh, do it in a loop. This is not elegant, but it might probably be nicer to your stack. The good part is we can st still keep the test that we uh, wrote beforehand um, because the specification is still the same. And this is the way that we can prevent regression bugs from happening. If you work like this, you have a couple of interesting results. Okay, So you have fewer bugs leading to reliable software. If you do it all over your code base, you have a high coverage. And high coverage gives you confidence in your code base. It gives you control about what's going on. You have this thing about um, documentation, so it helps you understand things. And uh, when someone asks you, well, is the code base really adaptable? Can it be extended? Then you can just say, well, I refactored the code 10 times today as part of my TDD cycle. So yeah, I'm pretty sure that it's um, adaptable. So reliable software, confidence in code, understanding. That sounds familiar. That's the stuff that we were looking for. So great news. OK, I will tell my AEM developers about it. They will be so happy. Now we have some finally found a solution for that. Um, well, it turns out it's not that easy. It turns out that when your boss comes to you and says, OK, your goal is to achieve 100% code coverage, uh, that doesn't work. OK, so you need some, something more than just energy and will to do it, especially when your code looks like this. OK, so here's um, an example. We have some events, and then we loop through the events. We take out the next event. What do we need from it? Well, we need the path, and uh, well, not just any path. It needs to comply, it needs to satisfy some, some conditions. So it needs to end with something, and then we're ready to go. So we log into the repository, we get the session, we get the node, and then we need even more um, filtering because um, this, the following code should only apply to, s to nodes that uh, have a property um, with a certain template. So some template needs to be satisfied. And then we can call what we were actually intending to call, and that is an export function. But we're not done yet. Uh, we still need to catch some exceptions and do some cleanup, like logging out. OK? Uh, the actual code, so this is inspired by real code. The real implementation code is bigger and more complicated. So this is just the part that fits into one slide. So the team said, um, well, I mean, look at the code. I mean, isn't it obvious? We already tried everything, OK? So we tried mocks. They didn't really help us. Then we wasted even more time using end-to-end -end tests, um, Selenium and other crazy things that are fragile and hard to maintain. Um, we even tried in-container tests um, to make it work inside of, of a real AEM environment. Those are the tests that get ignored most. So. Basically, it means, yes, we can reach some coverage to some extent, but I mean, it's pretty obvious, right? It's going to be a lot of tedious work, and it's going to be very expensive. So the team said, it's obvious you cannot test everything in AEM, at least not without losing your mind. OK. <coughs> To avoid this kind of situation, let's relax, OK? So there's no need to lose your mind. First of all, TDD is not about testing in a specifically clever way, OK? So this is not what TDD is about. Actually, TDD is not even about testing. TDD is about coding, and it's, it's about co writing code in a different way. The attitude is, testable is the new clever. 
So what we did is um, we worked together. Okay, so we really took some time. We tried out new and different design approaches. And here's what we found out that works for us. Maybe it works for you as well, but at least for our projects, it worked. So let's get back to this method that I've shown you a couple of minutes ago. It's this one. You remember down here, there's this export, um, this process export um, function inside of this same busy, busy class. Um, the original code is also mm, about 100 lines of code. Um, I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg. So what it basically does is um, it gets values from, from, from node properties. So for example, this group property, whatever it does, um, if it exists, then we're fine. Otherwise, log this event and then uh, abort the whole pro uh, export process. It does more magic. Um, and then what this is actually all about is we want to export it to files. Um, I think the original implementation uses three different files where this, uh, which are um, required, um, and then those values get copied there. Um, at the end of the story, we need to catch exceptions and clean up files. Okay. Maybe some of you are familiar with clean code. Um, in clean code, there is something called the single responsibility principle. Basically, it means a class should have only one reason to change. So when you use a clean code approach, what you do is you try to find the reasons to change. Okay, so what could be a reason for the event loop to change? Uh, well, those will mostly be technical reasons, so maybe in, in, in some AEM upgrade, the API changes, or you decide to use something else um, uh, for your m event handling and messaging queues. Okay, the data retrieval um, is also part of the code that we just saw. This might change because your data structure uh, might change, or you do things that we keep doing um, that we've started uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, months ago. Um, you move things out of JCR into a MongoDB or something else. The data processing, so the real business rules, well, those are all the change requests that you get from the business people. Okay, so they might be a reason why you need to change something. And um, the export to file system, this is actually happening right now. We, are, uh, we have a change request to change this from export to file system, um, and instead it's we are supposed to use a RESTful service for that. And then, of course, the format, currently it's CSV, but in the future it will be something else. But also the little columns in there, the data formats and so, so on, they depend on, in this case, on, on the, the system on the other side that consumes our data. So there might be um, other reasons why this changes. So this is all nice. Um, in real life, this can lead to some discussions um, in the team. So what exactly is a reason to change? And why is it this? What do we have those reasons? And why don't we have less or more reasons? And how about keep it simple? Is this still what we want or are we thinking too far ahead into the future? So all kinds of discussions like that. Or you can look at it from a TDD point of view. So from a TDD point of view, you imagine yourself, okay? So you imagine you're supposed to write tests for the code that I've just so, uh, shown you. And maybe you don't want to do it. So from a TDD point of view, you would say, uh, no, um, that's not, not the way uh, we want to work. Um, let's not be clever at testing, OK? So let's not find any new hacks uh, to, um, or tools to improve our testing. Instead, the goal should be to fix the code instead. By the way, this only works if you can change the code. If you have a good code base that cannot be changed, if you're not allowed to change it, then of course, good luck. So we write the tests first, and then we find code that works best for those tests. And the attitude is we start simple, but um, we are thorough, OK? We, we look at all the edge cases, and uh, we always aim at being 100% complete 
with our tests. So for example, what we could do um, in, in this code base is we identify rules that we have. Okay, so one rule, for example, when exporting is, um, okay, when I have my, my data being up there, so it's just initialized, all, of all the attributes are um, null, then we, uh, we specify, okay, all the nulls should be converted to empty strings, okay? This is not the most sophisticated requirement, but um, I hope you see what this is aiming at. And um, how can we test that? Well, we could just use another simple data structure like an, like an uh, uh, array list, okay? It's like a list of, of, of strings, and then make sure that everything is empty in this row. Okay, don't forget the closing brackets. <laughs> um, so using this kind of approach um, gives us unit testable code, okay? So there are no external things that we need to take into account. The input data is a plain old Java object. The output is, well, also just, just a list of things um, that we can test. So we can write a lot of tests very fast um, without having any integration concerns. In production, the code might look something like this. So we iterate through the items that are being passed to this, uh, the, th the, the, the target that we want to export it to. Uh, let's make sure that we, we don't have any null values. Then we call this toList function. And then one thing that we found out is pretty useful is using consumers. Um, because in your test scenarios, you can, can use um, array lists and then just list add. Um, so you can test what the expected result is. And in the real production and scenario, you would write it to an output stream. The, the complete solution could, well, not the complete solution, but, but on a larger scale, uh, it could look like something like this. We still have to loop through, th through the events. But our goal is to have as many unit tests as possible. So let's get the hell out of there, okay? So when we are in such a function, let's get out of there as fast as possible. We need to um, have this event um, loop because, well, this is what the API requires us to do, but let's get out of there as fast as possible. So the next step is just take everything that we need as kind of input data into something that I have just decided to call a context. Um, basically, this is just a path uh, right now. Um, and all the magic is supposed to happen inside of a service. Okay, the service needs access to the, to the repository, so uh, we create a data access object um, that has the reference to the repository or a resource resolver or whatever you need um, in this context, and then call the service. So this is basically what we need um, there, and the service itself has no such dependencies. It's, it has the process function um, that operates on this um, context object. So this is just a plain old Java object. It has a reference to this DAO, but this DAO is just an interface, okay? So um, there's no magic there. Um, and we'll, what we basically do is we call a function on, on, on that um, interface. So this can be tested in a nice way. The exporter too is just an interface. So the whole service has no dependencies, um, uh, which makes it um, testable. So if you look at, at all the parts of the application, for the event loop, you need to do some, uh, um, um, some setup, um, but it's rather simple. For the DAO part, thank God there are AM mocks that they make life uh, pretty easy, but we only use them for testing the, the DAO implementations. The hard part, the data processing, is actually the easy part because we just use POJOs, so they are completely unit testable. When it comes to exporting to the file system, well, we use the POJOs. Um, the part about integrating with the file system requires some thinking. I'm still impressed that it's far easier to do it in PH, uh, PHP with the virtual file system, um, but it's, it's also possible to do it in, in Java. And about the specialized format, that's also just plain Java code. Inside of the service, as I just shown you, uh, we have interfaces. So in our test scenario, they can all be replaced by stops, and we're ready to go. 
And now when you compare it to the single responsibility principle, you know, this asking yourself about what reasons are there to change the code. Well, it's pretty much the same, okay? So you will find yourself slicing um, your code in, in kind of the same way. Bottom line of this is, if you really want to make TDD work for you, you need to decouple your code. And in order to decouple your code, you will need to use things like single responsibility principle, dependency inversion, the concept of ports. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so all the tools that, um, on, and principles and, and practices that you have will help you there, which basically means that TDD will lead you to a cleaner code base. If you follow those rules, if you stick to those rules, one of those rules is, for example, don't use Mokito to, to mock your own code, but that's for a different talk, maybe for a lightning talk later. <laughs> um, okay, so this works on the level of methods and, and classes. Does that also work on application scale? So let's look at that. How can that work when you look at the complete application? There are many books and articles um, on this topic. Um, one of them is the concept of ports and adapters, um, also known as hexagonal architecture by Alistair Coburn. Um, a similar concept is the dependency rule by um, Uncle Bob Martin. And I am shamelessly copying his graphics here, um, adapted for AM. The original graphics is down there uh, in the link. So the dependency rule graphic looks like this. In the core of your application, you might have what can be called the enterprise domain. Okay? So for example, we do a lot of projects for Mercedes-Benz. And when you do projects for Mercedes-Benz, everyone knows what an MPC is. If you work for Mercedes-Benz, you know what an MPC is. This is something that, uh, but it's not specific to, your, to our application. Other application um, teams also know what it is. Or an Actros, well, it's, it's a car, okay, it's a truck, <laughs> so you know what that is. This is not specific to our um, applications, um, but those are things that exist throughout the entire enterprise. Around that, there's the application-specific business um, layer, the, the application-specific domain. Um, one of our projects is uh, Roadstars, which is an online community for truck drivers. So there is the domain concept of a trucker profile. A different application um, contains information about parts that the truck consists of. So we have equipment codes that are part of that. So these are all um, domain-specific things that belong only to those applications. Now the dependency rule says that source code dependencies can only point inwards, okay? Which makes perfect sense, because just because we created an application that has some, some, some specific rules will, of course, not mean that Mercedes-Benz or any other customer will change or depend on our application. It's the other way around. We can use their stuff, but they, they don't care about us. And they shouldn't. The next layer is um, the part where use cases happen, okay? So if you use an approach like model view controller, that's the part where controllers um, happen, and then the data can be transformed in kinds of presenters, so they can be used for being output. Um, there might be gateways to communicate with external systems. That's the place where data access objects live. And the dependency rule tells us it's OK for the controllers to know the application domain, but not the other way around. Okay? Your business rules should not depend on controllers or presenters or um, um, data outside of that. The last layer is the rest. Okay? So it's everything that is around it, um, around your application, external dependencies. The web, for example, or the shell, if you have a shell, um, if you have code that needs to run in the shell. The UI, 
whatever concept you, you follow there. Just generally environment, so OSGI, for example, would be environment or something else that you might come across. The system date, okay, this is external um, and needs to be treated in a special way, especially for testing. And as for gateways, well, you have internal data like the database or the JCR. So this is the area where Resource Resolver lives, um, the file system, or maybe you need to communicate with external systems uh, through SOAP, REST, or whatever your fla favorite flavor is. And the dependency rule tells us only inwards, okay? So your use cases should not depend on the web, the shell, and all those external things that are around it. Um, and certainly your application um, logic should not depend on it. In order not to run out of time, I'm skipping this. Okay, so you might ask yourself, um, hold on, um, I need this data, okay? So how can this concept work when the the interesting stuff, so so the data that I need or the data that I so the, the parts that I need to send my data to are outside and I cannot point into that direction. Okay, so how can, how can I read data and, and write data? Well, that's what dependency inversion is for. Okay, or um, this concept of ports. To put it in a very simplified way. You create interfaces, like the DAO interface. So your application domain has a reference to the, to the, to the interface, um, but you are totally free of all the, the details of the implementation. And for us, it turned out that this is actually the key to success. So when we combine the TDD approach and keep the dependency rule in mind, then we can um, reach really good results. So what we do um, in our projects is first we look at the core part. So what is the domain? Which part of it is the enterprise domain? Which part is the application specific domain? And um, I assure you there is a domain, okay? Um, if it's not, you should maybe be using WordPress, but usually there is a domain. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a developer told me um, no, no, there is no, no domain, everything is just plain code. And he was kind of right, because his services were totally empty, there was nothing in the models, and I thought, well, maybe he's right. But then I found the package called helpers, okay? It was next to the package utils, and guess what was there? Of course, there was the domain. So uh, what we do is we start at the domain. It has a very nice side effect because um, that's the code that's easiest to test, right? We just have plain old Java objects. We can do conditions um, on that code, which makes it easy to get 100% from the very first line of code that you write. And then you can stay at 100% of code, 100% uh, uh, coverage, when you just slowly um, move out to the to the outskirts. There are many things on the outskirts. Um, remember this, this, uh, this diagram. I'm just pointing to one or two um, interesting aspects that we found valuable, and that is keep the resource resolver out, okay? Keep it out of your domain, of your rules, um, and especially your APIs. Once you have public methods in classes and especially interfaces that, that need the resource resolver, that interface is kind of poisoned and it will be hard to test this uh, the code behind it and this kind of approach is what we do on a daily basis so we use it when we write services models components workflows listeners okay so so this um, this kind of thinking applies um, pretty much everywhere so does it pay off for us okay is it worth um, all the effort well, first of all, we actually reach 100% coverage using this approach. Not for the old parts, okay, <laughs> but for the new code. Uh, so when we um, uh, follow this, this through uh, for our new code, we have the 100% coverage and the benefits from, from that. Um, do we still have bugs? Yeah, we have. Um, but it turns out that most of them are 
related to front-end problems because we don't have the stuff for JavaScript, um, which actually means 100% coverage is a lie, okay, because the, the, the JavaScript code is not covered. But that's one of our next um, attempts to also introduce this kind of concept into front-end work. And the other mysterious area is uh, what we also heard a couple of minutes ago in a different talk, the mismatch between production data and, and uh, uh, what we have when we run our tests. This is a big problem. And don't tell me about package export. Um, on one project, we have 2.3 million pages on the author. OK, so uh, importing the, 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 the package um, takes a week, and then it breaks. Um, overall, we are faster um, using this approach. And what we all like most of um, all is developers no longer lose their minds. And they really um, like this kind of approach. OK, some useful links, maybe. Um, I was talking about ports and adapters just very briefly. Here's a link to the article um, by Alistair Coburn. The DAO pattern, which is also important to keep the resource resolver out. You can Google the DAO pattern. Um, I like the, uh, the flavor using the repository pattern as some kind of a subset of, of a DAO uh, more. So you can take a look at that. About clean architecture, um, there will be a, a book um, by my Uncle Bob Martin that should be published any day now, and the article about the dependency rule. If you're interested about test first, um, there's an article on that as well. The other thing is the, the bowling game cutter. This is a 50-slide presentation that gives you um, a step-by-step -step, um, walkthrough um, including all the refactoring and so on. Um, so this is also interesting to get into this kind of thinking. Um, if you want to learn more about the single responsibility principle and other clean code principles, here's a link to the principles wiki. And the last one is a presentation by Sebastian Bergmann. Sebastian Bergmann is the author of PHP unit. Yes, you heard right, PHP unit. Um, he's a pretty cool guy, um, and what he did, and that's the cool part, he did some research um, on scientific papers um, about quality assurance testing and, and uh, test-driven development. Um, bottom line, there is scientific proof for this idea that um, a test-driven approach makes you faster, okay? So if you don't trust me, trust the science, science people. If you want to look at code examples, I posted um, the code to, to GitHub. I think I have 100% coverage. I refactored a bunch of things uh, the other day. Um, but I will push my latest changes there, too. So we can take a look at it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. So are there any questions? Everyone's hungry. Yes. Hello, Andreas. First of all, thank you very much for the hey, very yeah. interesting session. Um, you already mentioned that this topic is probably a topic for a separate session, but um, I would like to ask you this question about um, Stubbs and um, uh, Mokito, or uh, mocking in uh, general. I hope you still know that I also prefer not using Mokito, but mm. sometimes I'm still asking myself when I use stubs and for, for example to stub mm. some DAO and later on I add some additional methods to this DAO or object, I have to change and maintain those stubs. Mm. With using Mokitos, I wouldn't have this problem. What is mm. the real benefit, in your opinion, of completely uh, not using Mokito in a kind mm. of radical way? Yeah, you've just answered the question um, because um, you just said that, that you add more methods to, to, to this, um, to, the, to the interface. And one clean code principle is the interface segregation principle, which means only add, put stuff into an interface that are, is actually needed, okay? So keep them small. Don't force an implementing class to implement more than it needs. Um, when you have this convenient method, you know, using Mokito, 
you don't care about it. Okay, you can just just um, 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 create interfaces that are big without having trouble. If you don't use them, you will see, aha, okay, now I need to add even more, I need to change all the, the all those stops if I don't have centralized stops. Um, so this is the way, uh, this is the reason why I um, like to avoid mocks. You need to feel the pain that your code causes and then you, uh, uh, you are able to make um, decisions um, about it. So, so this is the, the attitude. I use mocks, mocks um, and uh, I remember one project for a bank where I needed uh, mocks all over the place because we had to deal with le legacy code. So if you, for, for, for um, um, handling legacy code or external third-party code, mocks are totally cool. They're actually the only thing that you can use sometimes. But don't use them for your own code. Sometimes I make an exception and I say, okay, you guys, okay, here, if you know what you're doing, then, um, then, then use mocks. And two weeks later, broken Windows theory, and I regret this decision, okay? <laughs> um, so that's one of the reasons why mocks should be avoided. Okay, and probably up in very, very small interfaces and many interfaces. Some people would say, yeah, why don't you, why do you separate this into, you know, it's the interface with two methods which are pretty similar, yeah. doing the same thing, maybe with some just other input parameters. So yes, but mm. probably there's, there is <coughs> no silver bullet answer to no. this question. Yeah. No. Well, generally, smaller interfaces, smaller classes are easier to maintain. So this is what you should keep in mind. Um, uh, with, with Java 8, and uh, we even have one more benefit. If you have only one method in your interface, then you can, can uh, use all the, the functional magic there, and you can use lambdas. Um, so I, I like that. It, you get rewarded for <laughs> for concise uh, things, but I mean, you're right. I mean, we've been working together um, on projects in the past, so um, there is no uh, complete answer to all questions, um, and you need to dive into those problems individually. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions?